Hello and welcome to my lecture review for the Cybex book, the CompTIA Server Plus Study Guide. It is the 2016 edition. It is published by Wiley. And this is going to be covering the individual chapters prepping for the CompTIA Server Plus certification. Chapter 10 is about troubleshooting hardware and software issues. So in this chapter, we're going to be looking at things like troubleshooting methodology, looking at effective troubleshooting techniques, looking at tools and methods for appropriately determining the problem for both hardware and software. So first of all, troubleshooting theory and methodology. There are tons of different methods out there. So when you're studying for a specific exam, you need to understand their methodology. CompTIA has one way, Cisco has another, Microsoft has another, and so forth. The issue is you cannot say, oh, well, I know one and it's, it, it's what's best. All of them may be slightly different. So keep that in mind. The Server Plus CompTIA version is going to follow this type of methodology. Step one, identify the problem and determine the scope of the issue. That's asking questions. Maybe looking at documentation and, if possible, try to duplicate. So, what kills me is the third and fourth bullet point is identical on the slide. Uh, one thing you want to do is replicate the problem, see if you can get it to do the exact same thing ask questions, ask open-ended questions. Maybe look at what uh, changed or look at the environment. Look to see what has been modified. Also try to get a clear understanding from the user about what the issue is. The reason I say that is I've encountered numerous times where the user said one thing, they put a ticket in, I fix the ticket and I leave. I never verify with the user and what the user said the problem was and what the actual problem was were two different things. So we have to keep that in mind. Step two, establish a theory of probable cause. Again, question the obvious. Make sure if we have kind of a general idea of what the issue is, look at how the situation might have caused that problem. Determine whether the issue is an element uh, or a symptom, and is it causing multiple problems. Step three will be test the theory to determine the cause. So essentially, once we have a theory, we confirm the theory, determine uh, how to resolve the issue. If the theory turns out not to be correct, not a big deal. You go back through step one and two, and you repeat as many times as necessary. If the theory is not established, you may have to escalate. So try, and if you still can't handle it, escalate. Step four, establish a plan of action to resolve the problem, as well as notify the impacted users as appropriately. If you need to implement the solution directly, do it. If you need to escalate, escalate. Make sure to communicate with all of the impacted parties. Make uh, one change at a time, test and verify as you go through. That way, it, you don't have to worry about making 10 changes and all of a sudden having all these other new issues pop up. One change at a time to verify. If the problem is not resolved, change management. Go back, revert, try again. Implement the new change and check if the desired result is present. Step five is verify functionality. Verify the system's functioning, verify the user uh, issues resolved, verify that everything is back in working order. Again, stressing the importance of verifying the user's issue is resolved because what you assume it is and what they think it is are two different things. You want to make sure you fix what the user problem is. Step six, perform a root cause analysis. Step seven, document the appropriate findings, the actions, the outcomes, and when necessary, provide user training. Step seven is always gonna be document and user training. 
Training your staff on how to respond to certain things is a useful troubleshooting technique. So keep those seven general steps in mind when we're talking troubleshooting an issue. This process sets the tone for pretty much everything else. And this is the troubleshooting methodology steps. So when we're looking at troubleshooting hardware, we go through those those common seven steps. So if we're looking at hardware specifically, maybe things could be uh, failing to post, failing to turn on, uh, maybe a, a blue screen or windows not fully loading because of a, because of a physical hardware issue. Uh, onboard components failures. You'll notice almost all of this is dealing directly with a machine that is probably failing. A computer that fails to boot. It's overheating, memory issues, onboard component failure. Realistically, a technician normally is not going to be fixing the entire system. They may be replacing some parts, but more and more organizations are starting to realize if they are not under warranty, they just replace the machines. It's about how fast you can get that worker back up and working. That is why there's typically a life cycle so that failing hardware is replaced before it actually fails. Things like the processor failing. There's not a way for a person that, to handle that. So keep that in mind. On some servers, we have diagnostic tools. Uh, on a lot of these servers, uh, Dell, for example, has troubleshooting uh, add-on cards or troubleshooting utilities built in. That way you can do like memory uh, diagnostics or hardware diagnostics, things like that to verify the hardware. Operating system not found due to mechanical drive issue or due to hard drive issue or storage device issues. Driver failures, again that's probably going to be more towards on the software side, but those also happen. Power supplies overheating and power supplies failing. I live in the desert in Nevada and if equipment's not properly maintained, then it dies quicker. Uh, normally a five to six year life cycle of equipment prevents a lot of this from happening. Servers might live a little longer, but again, if the server runs something critical, replacing them in a regular interval is recommended. Running your entire business off a 20 year old server, some businesses do it, but when that server goes down, it's going to do a lot more damage. Third party components, that's always a fun one. When you are looking at purchasing hardware and you buy hardware from sketchy organizations or sketchy vendors, sometimes you can buy illegitimate components. We recently purchased probably 25 Cisco switches from a reputable vendor. What they delivered were all fake reproduction Cisco switches. They may run the software, but upon inspecting the hardware, it turned out the hardware were all fake. And the vendor did not even realize it. The vendor was just a reseller, so it really wasn't their uh, fault, but it happens. It happens a lot more than people realize, so definitely a, a big thing. BIOS issues on the motherboard. I don't know a lot of businesses that spend that much time focusing on individual workstations. If you're dealing with a server, updating the hardware and the software portions, the firmware, things like that on a regular basis, okay, I understand that. Regular basis on the server realm isn't, you know, every week. I have three servers that have not been restarted in over two years. The demand on both of those servers are 24-7. So there is no window for downtime. We have them set up in a, in a failover. So if one does die, we do have a backup. And we do try to schedule an appropriate window to do certain types of updates when appropriate. 
So there are kept up to date uh, as best we can. Cooling issues is always a concern with server equipment. The servers produce a lot of heat. And if they're not stored in a data center, for example, cooling is a concern. Having like dead fans, having a blockage because of ca bad cable management or because of dirt, dust, debris, a ladder leaning up against the equipment, all of that may prevent the system from cooling itself. So make sure you have proper cooling, proper dividers, proper component that will filter the air for the equipment. You can't just stack the equipment however you want. Servers are made to go in a rack or to stand uh, in a tower. There are air vents for them. There are cooling vents for them. There is a process that the servers go to suck air in from the front and blow air, air out from the back. If you ever see a data center, you have a hot aisle and a cold aisle. The front of the equipment faces the cold aisle. It sucks the cold air in from the front and pushes the hot air through the back. That why, that's why the hot and cold aisle are set up in that manner. So, for example, if we are looking at a machine that has, you know, clumps and clumps of dirt and dust and debris, well, that's an issue. That prevents proper cooling. This is also a fairly old computer, hence the IDE ribbons, but, and the AGP port and the PCI slots. But environmental factors like dirt and dust definitely exists, and they do build up. Regular cleaning, and again, regular is very subjective. Cleaning of the equipment definitely helps ensure the longevity of the hardware. Part of this is ensuring that we have the correct tools, the correct hardware to do what we need to do. Mismatch components are a good example. Realistically, things now are plug and play, but you still want to che uh, check for basic compatibility. If I plug this ECC RAM in to this computer, will it work? Most of the time the answer is yes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that in all instances it will. But dust is not the only environmental factor that affects equipment. Humidity, temperature, those are two big ones. If there's too much moisture in the air, that can damage the equipment. That can cause static electricity in the air. If the temperatures are too hot or too cold, the equipment doesn't run correctly. A server is made to handle more damage than a regular computer, granted. But a server is not going to run very well than, you know, 120 degree heat. So temperature is definitely a concern. Power surges. Power management of equipment. Having the steady amount of electricity that the machine needs is critical. And I said steady, that means if electricity goes up or goes down below the threshold, if it says it needs 115 um, watts and you're providing too little or too more, or too little or too much, that might cause more damage. And I, I said 115 watts, I meant 115 volts. Some... Uh, Countries do 110, 115, 120. Well, when you have equipment and it's made to work at a specific voltage, that sagging or it spiking can destroy the equipment. So blackout is where there is no power whatsoever. A brownout is typically a drop in voltage lasting for an extended period of time. A sag is a short-term drop in voltage. So brownouts and sags are similar. A brownout's longer than a sag. A spike is going to be, you know, typically a short time period, but it increases the amount of uh, voltage. And a surge is a much longer spike. Now, have I ever really needed to know, you know, spike versus surge? No. Realistically, the sags and the spikes are, are the big ones. Power, is it too little power or too much power? So some basic hardware tools 
definitely are going to be some diagnostic tools. In hardware, you can have like a, a postcard. I mean, I've used them, but in recent years, not really. More common diagnostic hardware tools are going to be like a multimeter for a testing power. Uh, canned or compressed air. We also have some electrostatic discharge equipment like a wrist strap. Those are also used. Uh, I, I wanted to say common, but they're not common so much, but they're definitely used. Realistically, if you are not a specific hardware technician, you're, you're not going to be diving deep into the hardware of a device. Yes, can you replace a hard drive? That, that's different than can you replace all of these key components on this workstation again normally business setting computers are under warranty and you warranty them out you may have to replace a hard drive maybe a, an optical drive add on a card add in ram those are all pretty self-explanatory none of that should require any real heavy duty equipment screwdriver but there are definitely some software tools that are very useful. The software diagnostic tools I think are crucial. So how do we troubleshoot software problems? A user can't log in. Well first of all are they typing the right username and are they typing the right password? That's a big one. Very common are password issues, maybe account disabled or expired issues. One thing that I've noticed with a lot of office workers is if you change their username, they're at lunch, I go in as an administrator, I do something. If I don't put it back to their username, they don't know how. So they end up locking my account out because they keep typing in their password, not reading that they're logging in as me. Inability to contact the domain controller. What's funny here is if the network is set up correctly, then this isn't just a problem that randomly starts. This would be a networking issue. Domain controller or DNS access, these are network service outages. So they're not really software problems, they are networking issues. Unauthorized user access equipment is definitely a big thing because users should be authorized to use the equipment. An unauthorized user is someone that's not supposed to, but actually is accessing the equipment. So that is definitely a concern. So one of the things that I've noticed, especially with the Server Plus server, is assuming infrastructure and you deal with the server side of the infrastructure house. However, infrastructure also deals with the networking portion, communication. So when a user cannot access a resource, it sometimes is a network issue or an infrastructure issue. It's not a server type issue. When you're dealing with unauthorized user access, that's a server issue. Uh, permission settings, that's a server issue. Inability to connect to the resource server caused by DNS or Active Directory failures. That could be server or networking or both. So we definitely have to keep that in mind. We have other OS issues. Things like the OS not loading correctly, BCD or the MBR data could be corrupted, or the portion of the hard drive that deals with loading Windows or loading the OS might be corrupted. Those are failures in the OS. That's definitely software. Uh, missing a grub, driver issues. Those are all things that definitely do occur. Driver issues is making sure that your equipment is kept up to date and you're buying name brand equipment. Buying generic hardware from a overseas manufacturer might cause driver issues. And again, when you're running server equipment that runs a business, you're normally wanting to make sure that you're buying equipment that is legitimate. Mounting a drive, especially in Linux, is not always as straightforward or as easy as it should be. So that's definitely going to be a software problem if you cannot mount the storage hardware or the storage volumes so that you can deal with the storage. That's a problem. 
logs. Not being able to write or read the log files or log locations. That's also a software and network and security based issue. Those are things that are needing to be done on a regular basis. So logs are one of those important things that just have to be there. But we also have things like services or service failures. Remember that Windows, even Linux and Mac OS's all have a bunch of services that run in the background. These services allow for the machine to function. So service uh, functionality has to be there. Service failure. If services are failing, then there's something going on. Patch uh, Patches that aren't being applied correctly. Again, those are telltale signs that something is going on. Whether it be hardware failure or malicious or a security concern, it just it varies. But these are definitely red flags in the software uh, realm. Things like hanging on shutdown or hanging on startup or not being able to print. These are all things that also are telltale signs that something is going on. Not being able to print. If you were printing and all of a sudden you can't print anymore, that's slightly different. Again, that could be server, that could be network, that could be uh, hardware because of the printer. It just There's too many variables that, that track that down. In Windows, we have the user access control. In Linux, it's sudo. And that is essentially being able to run things as a privileged user or run as type user. If we are in Linux, it's going to be a sudo. And then the action, then you'd uh, supply the appropriate credentials. In Windows, you'd have a UAC pop-up. When you're dealing with corrupt files or corrupt uh, storage devices, things like the SFC scan now are a big tool for scanning and verifying hard drive issues. You could also be uh, short of space. One of the fun parts, especially with server, is there are some applications, if there is not 20% of the hard drive free, the application doesn't work. Exchange in the Microsoft realm is very common if you have you know below a certain percentage of the hard drive not free exchange just stops working doesn't matter if it's an eight terabyte drive and you have you know two terabytes of storage if it's below a certain percentage that just is what it is though hard drive issues things like it not being optimized or data being fragmented could also lead to slower performance we have print issues since we just said printer uh, problems. Maybe a print spooler problem or a print service. There's, that also happens. There are some times where some malware goes after the print options because they want to clone print jobs. Virtual memory, uh, realistically, I don't even deal with virtual memory in a server. We make sure there is enough memory and that's how we solve that problem. Here, this server uh, 2012 R2 has 2 gigs of RAM. It's probably a virtual machine. Well, it is because it also has an i5 instead of an actual server processor. Realistically, virtual memory on a server, you should be able to leave alone, assuming you have a good amount of memory. Even my smaller servers have 64 gigs of RAM. My larger servers have 1.5 terabytes of RAM. You're not going to be running a server with less RAM. That, that normally is not existing anymore. Back, you know, 2000s, that's one thing. But now, in modern day environments, that's now no longer acceptable. To access our virtual memory, go to System Properties, go to Advanced, go to Performance. That allows us to look at our virtual memory and normally Windows manages that for you. You can set if you want, you can set no paging file, system manage, or you can hard code it to a specific uh, size. We've talked about logs in Microsoft Server. We have the event viewer and that is how we view logs in the server realm. Normal logs are application security, uh, 
setup and system, those are the main four. You can also set up forwarders to centralize your logs for log management. You can look at log properties, you can set the size, and you can kind of say what to do when logs get too large. You sometimes don't want to clear logs, so you have the ability to not overwrite event logs, and you have the ability to manually clear the logs when necessary. And realistically, I've never had to do this. I always centralize my logs, and we do log uh, analytics. We have monitoring tools that are built in, like the resource monitor. In server 2016, 2019, server 2021, the resource monitoring has only gotten better. In 2012, it was kind of iffy, but they've definitely increased. They normally show you the four main components, processor, disk, network, and memory, and they show you the utilization. They show you the service or the item that is using that resource, and they normally show you the current, the average, and the life of that resource. Here we have an example of processes. It gives you the process ID, what's committed, what it's working with, its shared resources and its private resources, and kind of what it's taking up in memory. In our PC area, we have our optimization tools. So here we have drive optimization. And again, if you're running mechanical drives, this will be acceptable. If you're running solid state drives, then this is no longer even an option. The reason I say that is because solid state drives don't need to be optimized and Windows recognizes solid state drives so that you can't actually optimize them. The optimization destroys the SSDs a little faster than they should, so they're very weary of that. We have our disk management or our computer management with disk management capability that provides a centralized location to look at all disks. That means physical disks, that means virtual disks, and that means our optical drives that Windows knows about. In our disk utility, we have the ability to initialize a disk if it's not initialized. We have the ability to set the appropriate boot type, like an MBR or GPT. After that, we have the ability to set our partitions and volumes. We can spread out our volumes if necessary. We can have one giant volume, or we can have smaller volu uh, volumes. You can tell this was done off of a Lenovo workstation, probably a Lenovo laptop, because you have the appropriate healthy uh, smaller partitions. You have the 650 gig predominant Windows partition and then you have a recovery partition of 25 gigs. You can also notice this is Windows 8. So more than likely a laptop. Here we have our variation. You know, you'll notice that disk 0 is the only physical disk and logically we have partitioned it up. If you want to change drive letters, you can right click on any of the volumes and you can click drive letter or change drive letter and then select the appropriate drive letter. When you do that, you may have to restart. All right, that's it for this chapter. If you have any questions, any concerns, please feel free to reach out. Thanks. So I want to thank you for going through this video lecture. If you have any questions, any concerns, definitely feel free to reach out. Remember that it's not enough just to under go through the video lecture. You want to make sure that you're understanding the material, and we do that by asking questions. So, however, we have the medium set up for questions. Ask them. Reach out. Let's let's discuss some of the topics in the chapter so we can further our understanding of what's going on. I look forward to working with you throughout the remaining of the modules. Thank you.